God, that we, he would empower us so we can live the new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we, we now nullify every plot, every plan, every scheme of the enemy that would seek to distract us from what you have to say to us. God, we say that we want clarity from you today. Give us wisdom, give us discernment, give us knowledge and understanding in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, would you help me say amen, please? Amen. amen. Now, just take a few seconds, greet your brothers and your sisters in Christ. I want us to read the text, and I don't want us to rush. I want us to just take our time and understand what God is saying to us. So, Romans chapter 6, we're reading from the English Standard Version, and we are picking up today from verse 11, just three verses today. Paul writing to the brothers and sisters in Christ at Rome. So here's what he says in verse 11 of chapter 6. So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. That is verse 12 and verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from the dead to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So do not and then present. Let's do a quick review, please. And so to do that, we'll drop back to verse 6 of chapter 6. And remember what we said last week, that there are three things that Paul says is necessary for every believer to live the new life in Christ. Number one is to know. Number two is to reckon or consider. And number three is to present. So that very quickly in verse 6, here is what he, so he wrote. He said, we know that our old self was crucified with Christ, and the purpose is in order that the old body of sin might be brought to nothing. Another translation says that the power of sin might be nullified. Again, what is the purpose for the power of sin being nullified? So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Hallelujah. We are freed from the power of sin. Now hear me carefully. Through our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not participating in Christ. We are engrafted or we are united with Christ. In Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So... Knowing has to do with our understanding of what God did for each of us in Christ. He did not do it in us ourselves. He did it for us in Christ. And the only way that we can enjoy, the only way that we can appropriate, that we can make it real in our own experience, is for us to be remaining in Christ. That is why Jesus said, I am the true vine, you are the branches. We will only be able to bring forth fruit to the glory of God as long as we remain connected to the vine. So knowing is knowledge imparted to us when the Holy Spirit speaks that rhema word to our spirits. In other words, Reading the Bible is very, very important. We must know the Word of God. David said that thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. However, we do not um, triumph over sin because we have an intellectual understanding of the Word of God. We only triumph over sin when the Holy Spirit speaks that word to our spirit. And so it's very important whenever we are going to study the Word of God, whenever we are going to read the Word of God, 
that each of us ask the Holy Spirit in humility to open our understanding and to speak the truth to us. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth is what sets you free. Today we are after our freedom in Christ. So let's go on. Um, here's what I wrote for you. I said the purpose of our union with Christ is really our death to sin as our Lord and resurrection with him meaning Jesus to a newness of life under a new Lord meaning the Holy Spirit is the one who now governs our lives on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. A new life that is now lived under the Spirit's leadership and empowerment to the glory of God. I also wrote, we know that we were baptized, we know that we were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ when we believed. We know that we died with Christ. We were also buried and resurrected with Him. We know that we have been raised to a new life in Christ. All these immutable, all these unchanging truths we know because the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and declares it to our spirits. When we hear the rhema of God, our faith comes alive. That's according to Romans 10, 17. We know that and our faith comes alive. We gain understanding, not merely here, but here. And as we gain understanding, we embrace this aspect of God's kingdom. In other words, it is revealed to us line upon line, precept upon precept, truth after truth. God does it progressively, not all at one time. That is how we walk into freedom. That's how we possess freedom. That's how we embrace the rule and the reign of God. So we all start off as babes in Christ. And then as we begin to encounter the work of God, as the Spirit of God begins to speak to us, we begin to go into conflict. Now it is out of this conflict when we rest in what Christ has done, that is when we begin to take possession of the things that God has given to us in His Son. So here's what I said for that. But knowing is not enough. For Paul, knowledge must transition to two other things for the full effect of Christ's redemptive work to be appropriated in our lives. So it is not enough that we know. It's not enough that we get excited and we shout and we sing. I have seen repeatedly believers hear the word of God and they get excited and they shout and they sing and some of them take out their hand keys and they wave and they say, Hallelujah, preach it, Pastor. Glory to God. They see all of that. Some of us go to the altar and we weep bitterly. Some of us weep for joy. Some of us are slain in the spirit. But when we get up, huh, when we get up, that is because we only received the knowledge. We did not go the other two steps that are necessary. So, Knowing is not enough to honor God. There is something that is called the indicative and the imperative. And so I'll touch on it briefly just to give you clarity. So the indicative has to do with what God says he has done for us in his son. You will, write th you will see throughout Paul's writings and all of scripture that there is always a portion in the particular letter or book which says God has done this for us in his son. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Um, what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Not things in heaven on the earth or under the earth. Neither death nor life nor peril or the sword. None of these things can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But that is the indicative what God has done for us. Because once we discover what God has done for us, there becomes the imperative where Paul says now, no longer are you to continue living like the old person. Now you have to live like the new person. So the indicative what God has done for us 
must become the imperative which is we confirm through intentionality we confirm to what God or who God says we are. So then, here is what I wrote. Indicative refers to all that God has done for us and therefore who we are. Imperative is the demand that we now live based on who we are rather than continue living based on who we were. A lot of believers have heard that they are a child of God. They have heard all these amazing things that God has done for them. But when you examine our lives, we are still living like the old person. We have to transition from that old person to the new person. And so how do we go about that? Here is what um, Douglas J. Moo said. He said, as always in Paul, the indicative grounds the imperative. In union with Christ, we have been made dead to sin and alive to God. It remains, now watch, it remains now for us to appropriate and apply what God has done for us. So that's what we'll be talking about. Listen to my friend Leon Morris. Christ's death and resurrection has altered or has changed our position. He said there, but I put it in the parentheses, our position. And they are, that is for me, we should live in accordance, now watch, with the new reality. How do we go about doing this? Reckon or consider. This is verse 11. Here is what Paul said. He said, so you also, in other words, in the light of what Christ has done for us, we also, I'm not just saying you, we all should now watch, consider ourselves or yourselves to be dead to what? The power of sin. And alive to God, how? Through Christ Jesus. To consider is to deem it to be so, to declare it to be so, to treat it as our new reality. You see, prior to COVID-19, we didn't have to wear a mask. We were not doing service on Facebook. We were all together. But now that COVID-19 is here and we understand that it is spread via air and our inhaling stuff, we are now in a new reality. People have been trying to deny it, but yesterday I was on the road for several hours. And I don't think of all the hundreds of people that I saw, more than four or five were without a mask. Why? It's a new reality. So in the same way, we have died with Christ. We have been buried with him through baptism and now been resurrected to a newness of life. A new life in Christ is our new reality. So Paul is saying we should reckon it to be so. Hallelujah. Come on, say with me, I must reckon that I am alive to God in Christ. I am no longer dead. I am alive. Hallelujah. So, Paul uses the word logizomai, so that's the Greek word that was translated reckon, translated consider. It's translated count, it's translated reckon or consider. Now, I take Carol and those of you who are accountants would love this. Logizomai is a very interesting word. It means to conclude based on strict accounting of what you have so that you accu accurately determine your state. You know, it, it, there are some people who like to cook the books. Here's how you cook the book. Now, don't get mad with me, but here's how you cook the book. You don't have the cash, but you're going and swipe your credit card and you're buying a Mercedes-Benz. And you and I think that because we drive a Benz, no, no, this is not to my brother who drives a Mercedes Benz. This is paid for. I, I'm talking about the mindset of people where they pretend to be what they are not. And this is frightening because Christians pretend to be what they are not when they are not living according to who God says we are. We are living according to what, who the world says we are. So watch now. 
God says that I died to sin, was buried, and resurrected to a new life. Therefore, I see myself as dead to my old way of life and a life to God in Christ Jesus. This is now my reality. What is my reality? I am a life to God in Christ Jesus. I am not a slave to sin. I am not a slave to the mindset that says that I am living in sin. I am a new person in Christ. Go with me, please. Here's what Thomas R. Schreiner said. To judge that one is dead to sin and a life to God is not an example of mind over matter. Instead, the judgment is based on what is true by virtue of being incorporated into Christ. So the point that he is making, the point that I'm emphasizing is that if you truly are in Christ, then it is not um, it is not this thing where people say, I will confess it, therefore it is. No, it's, it's not based on feelings. It's not based on human emotions or human intellect. It is based on the revelation of the Spirit of God that when we came to Christ and we accepted Him, we believed in Him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, not only of our sin, but the sin of the world, that we died with Christ, we were buried with Him by baptism into death and resurrected into newness of life. When we believe that, that is not mind over matter, that is truth. It is the truth that Jesus said will set us free. Here is Douglas J. Moo again. He says, this new state is only is possible only in our union with Christ. We are alive to God only in Christ Jesus. Being dead to sin and alive to God is a state achieved only in union with Christ. So it is very important, my, my dear brother and sister, all of you who are watching us know that you ask yourself one question. Am I in Christ? It's not if you observe rituals and ceremonies. The question is, are you in Christ? Because it's not if you read your Bible, it's not if you go to church, it's not if you pray, and all of those things are very, very important for us to do. But what determines whether we are freed from sin and can live in units of life is whether or not we are connected, whether we are engrafted, whether we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 30 seconds for you to examine yourself because this is important this is not church talk this is not singing or shouting this is the reality of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ here is Paul in Galatians 2 20 here's what he says I have been past tense I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live, so I've been crucified with Christ, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, so, so see the reality for Paul. There are no ifs, there are no buts. He said that he was, he considered himself to have been crucified with Christ to have been buried with Christ and to have been resurrected to newness in life. This is Paul writing not only in Romans but also in Galatians. He lived out that truth and the only way we would live out that truth is if we understand how Paul went about it. Leon Morris again, I have a cousin named Leon who is also a Bible teacher. Um, so he carries the same first name but watch. But sin to the unbeliever is the natural consequence of the fact that he is a slave to sin. Whereas, the sin of the believer is quite out of character why he was set free. The believer was set free from sin. So for us, sinning is an abnormality. We, when we sin, that is something that should not be, it makes us feel weird. When we tell a lie or if we are a bigot, 
or if we are racist or any of those things, if we practice any of those things or we are cheating people or whatever it is, that is abnormal. That's not the life of Christ. That's the old man and we are living in the old realm, whereas we should have transitioned by now to the new realm, but you cannot transition into what you don't know. And then you cannot transition into what you know until you reckon it to be so. And then we'll talk about the next part. So how do we apply this new life in Christ? I'm watching my clock and I'm trying to get the message across to you. Many believers stop at either knowing or knowing and considering or knowing and reckoning. They do not complete the circle so they remain circling in life like the Israelites circling in the wilderness. You see, the Israelites used to be slaves in Egypt. God delivered them, the Bible says, by a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. He defeated Pharaoh and his army and drowned them in the Red Sea. God did all of that for them. But yet, in the wilderness, the children of Israel, because they did not fully understand, they were always craving to go back to Egypt because they missed the leek and the onions and the garlic. And that there was the slave's mindset. As long as we're dependent on other people, as long as we're dependent on massa, as <laughs> massa is a colloquial term that meant a ruler over you, and sin was the massa for them. So, so as long as believers are in this mindset, they will never transition into the new life in Christ that is spoken about in Romans chapter 8, that is freedom and liberty of the sons of God. And what that, anyway, let me not get ahead of myself. I'm, I'm kind of excited and I'm rushing, but I need to slow down. By presenting ourselves to God is how we make this transition. So Romans 8, 30, 6, 13, here's what he says. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Do not is in the present continuous tense. In other words, when he says do not, he means this is not a one-off thing. You can't do it yesterday and not do it today. You can't do it at this moment and not do it later in the day or tomorrow. Every moment we have to choose to do not present any member of ourselves as instruments unto sin to be used for unrighteousness. So do not is a constant, right? But introduces, the word but introduces a very strong contrast. We are first of all to present ourselves to God our total selves to God and I'll come back and explain what that means so let me deal with that right now what do we mean by when Paul says well not what do we but what does Paul mean when he says present yourselves evidently he is not speaking merely of our physical bodies because where our mind goes that's where our bodies go so then when Paul is speaking about presenting, he is starting first of all with our minds. It is our minds, our intellect, right? It is our capabilities that we have to present to God. And when we present our total capabilities to God, then our members, whatever it is, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, whatever it is, all of those would then pre be presented unto God as instruments to be used for righteousness. So hear me. If my mind is not being renewed because I'm feeding it on the wrong stuff, I will speak negatively rather than life. I will speak death rather than life. Go, go with me. Um, no, let me not get ahead of myself. <laughs> I, I, I so want you to get what the Lord has deposited in me. So, what does present mean? Paul uses the word paristono, right, paristono, and it means to make available to someone for special use. To present means to make available to someone or some power for special use. It also means to place at the disposal of another. You avail yourself 
to another for them to use. It means to make oneself subject to or to place oneself under the authority of another. So when Paul says do not make, he means don't present yourself, don't, don't offer yourself as, as an instrument for, for unfruitful things in essence. Here is Douglas J. Moo. Excuse me. Now that we understand ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God, we must constantly avoid using what? Our abilities and resources in the service of sin. Our natural capacities are weapons that we are not to offer in service to the tyrant sin. So you see, there, that, that there to me is the negative side. On the flip side, which is the positive, we're not offering our natural capabilities as weapons to be used by any, but we're offering them unto God for him to use for his honor and glory. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that is where this ministry got its name, and it's what we're after. He says, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and I put in sisters, how by the mercies of God, to present or to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your or our spiritual worship. Um, here is Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you see, as we present our, our capabilities and ourselves to God, we will only be producing good works, which is what God has ordained us to do before he laid the foundations of the earth. So watch with me now very carefully. Newness of life is really the spirit-empowered fruitful kingdom living. This is being more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. So it's this newness of life when we live in this realm. And that is why I have on the screen this image that there is darkness and death on the one side where you cross over through the cross of Christ. We cross over through the cross of Christ because the cross of Christ speaks of our death, our burial, and our resurrection to newness of life. Now, now watch me. Let us embrace. So the guy is running out from death now. He's being resurrected to new life. That's the image there. Let us embrace God's unlimited life by refusing to live in the world others created for us by our acceptance of their label. So I'm going somewhere with this now. Whoever you and I allow to label us if we accept that label, we are giving them power over us. That's the first point I want to make. Secondly, we would be embracing their definition of who we are. We are also embracing the limitations based on those labels. Now hear me. All right, let me bring up this other slide. <laughs> so we, we can do it here. We give power to those who label us. When we accept their label, we are embracing their definition of who we are. We also buy wholesale, sorry, buy wholesale the limitations built into their label. The Apostle Paul refused to accept any label that diminished the life of Christ in him, that diminished his status as a child of God. Paul did this even when rejecting the label placing, that placed him at a disadvantage. In, in other words, there were certain benefits to certain labels. But Paul rejected all of these human labels, all of these social constructs, as I call them. Paul rejected them so that he could embrace the new person that he was in Christ. Um, here's where I'm going with this. A lot of people are crying out for social justice. A lot of people are crying out for racial equality and all of that. Listen to me. If it does not start with the changing in your thinking of who you are, men cannot give it to you because whatever people give to you, they will take from you. Hear me clearly. If you accept a label, and I'm going to use one that is commonly used over here and in other parts of the world. If you accept that label, you do not understand who you are in Christ. 
I hear many, many believers saying, I'm a black man, I'm a white man. Do you understand what you're really saying? You are a child of God, and you are using a social construct that places limitations on you, that enslaves you, but you embrace that construct to define yourself, and then you want to fight for that label. That is not how the child of God should be thinking or behaving. You have to see yourself as a child of God, that you are a new person in Christ and put off, cast off the limitation of these constructs, of these self-descriptions that put you into a box. Because hear me please, whatever you define yourself as, whatever limitations go with that label that you have placed on yourself, that is the realm in which you live. So if you see yourself as an abused woman, if you see yourself as a man who is limited by his ethnicity or his education, then that's your realm. You cannot get outside of that box because your mind, which is unrenewed, is trapping you in that, set, in that state. You as a child of God have to cast that off. That's why Paul said in Ephesians, he said, we cast off every imagination. We bring every thought into captivity to what? The knowledge of Christ. Because it is the knowledge of Christ that liberates you so that you can function as a child of God within the kingdom of God which is beyond the earth. Hallelujah. I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you revelation here. So um, here, here is Paul in um, Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 8. And here's what he says. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of what the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He went on in verse 8 me. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I know I am messing with your mindset. I know I'm messing with your theology, but this is what the new person in Christ really means. Take off these limitations. Here is Paul in verse 9. So I want to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Here is Philippians 2.12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me my his own. So in, in other words, what Paul was saying, having cast off my national identity, having cast off my, my ethnicity, I now am in pursuit of becoming this new man in Christ. I have not yet gotten there, but I'm constantly in pursuit of it. I am not limiting myself to live in the realm of human description and human affirmation. I am now in pursuit of living in God's realm and having God's affirmation. Can I have a good amen if you truly understand what I'm saying to you today? Amen. So here's what I, I, I know this is really messing with your mind and it's going to take a lot to struggle, to grasp and to wrestle through. But here is... Here is what I wrote for you. This is me, and I love when Mary Lee brands my stuff for me. We must learn to see ourselves as God sees and has declared us to be. We are sons and daughters of God. This means that the sky is our limit. Our limit is determined by how we see God and not how mere humans may choose to define us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the liberty of the sons of God. Here in, in, in chapter 4 of Romans, we read that God calls those things as be not, that be not as though they were. Why? Because God is able to confirm everything, C-O-N-F-O-R-M. God is able to conform everything to what he declares it to be. Our challenge is that we have to come to the place where we have our minds renewed so we can acknowledge who God says we are and we can function at that level. That was the whole process that Abraham had to go through. 
that he started off as this mere man who was fearful and an idolater, and he became the father of many nations as God spoke over him. God has spoken the same thing over us. Take off these limitations by declaring yourself to be a race, which is a social construct, that people have created these all these labels to lock you into a box, into a paradigm. And when you go about saying, I'm a black man, I'm a black woman, I'm a white man, I'm a white woman, I'm a Chinese man, I'm a Chinese woman, I'm a, I'm a, whatever you call yourself, you are putting yourself in a box that God never placed you in. You're giving yourself a label that God never gave you. You are the apple of God's eye. So here, here is John. I'm wrapping up now. Jen, you can come back and we get ready, please. Here is what John said. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. It's always evolving. The more we understand it, the more we expand our thinking in Christ, the more we evolve, we keep developing. But we will know that when he appears, we shall be but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So as we increasingly get to see Christ, as he appears to us, as he unveils himself to us, so it is that we begin to conform. Stop living within limits. Here is him in verse 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Jesus lives without limits. How should we be living without limits? You and I are who God says we are, not who other people say we are. Stop thinking of yourself in these narrow, humanistic, ungodly terms. That means when we think like that, we're still enslaved to sin. When we begin to see ourselves, who am I? Ian Taylor, who are you? I am a child of God. I am made in the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.29 tells us that God predestined us to conform to the image of his son. That is it. That's what we're in pursuit of. Conforming to the image of Christ. Cast off all these other labels. Begin to see yourself as who God says you are. Made in the image and likeness of Christ. So what is our assignment today? So we have to know, we have to reckon, and then we have to present, right? So we present our, ourselves and then our members to God. Self-describe with God's words. In other words, the words you and I must use to describe ourselves must be the words of God. The word we must, words we must use to describe each other must be the word of God. We shouldn't be going around using ethnic names to describe the children of God. They are our brothers and sisters of, uh, in Christ. Yes, we come from different countries. We look differently. We sound differently. But we are all children of God. And if we see each other like that, we can truly relate to and love each other because we will not be trying to oppress each other. Think, speak, and live in our new reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our assignment. This is big, and this is what we're in pursuit of for the rest of our life. Jen, you want to take it away, please? I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. Come on, sing it with him. I'm no longer a slave to I'm sin. No
and then we need to present ourselves unto God and our members as instruments of righteousness unto holiness to be used for the glory of God. All of that starts with a renewal of our mind. So as our minds are renewed, we change the way we think, we change the way we speak, and definitely the way we behave. And my challenge to all of us is begin with how you self-describe. Begin to describe yourselves as who God says you are, his children, not an ethnicity, not a race, or anything else, not a defeated person. You and I are children of God. Amen. Now on Wednesday night, join us please at 7 p.m. We will begin in Revelation. We are going into Revelation chapter 6, which deals with the seals. And so we'll begin talking about what the seals are. And as, as, the, as the Lamb of God breaks the seals. And then next week Sunday, we'll be having Eon the Upgrade. So you could have a little break. Eon the Upgrade will be ministering the Word of God. I want to encourage you to join us for both services. Invite other people to join us, please. And so um, we bless you in the Lord Jesus. Let's, let's just pray, please. And then we'll close off. Father and God, today in Jesus' name, we thank you, God, for everyone who has joined us. And Father, for those who are yet to join or to watch this study, we pray in Jesus' name, God, that all of us who have heard would have received a rhema word from your spirit. God, that you would liberate us because you speak directly to our spirits through your word. And so, God, we pray your blessing, God, that all of us would know we would accept and we would therefore present ourselves as being dead to sin, buried with Christ God, and then resurrected to newness of life so that God, we can live as your children in a new realm, the realm of the spirit where we honor and glorify you in all that we do. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stretch forth your hand, please. Let's do the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and be gracious unto you. May the Lord watch over you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Encourage someone to watch the um, study, please. Uh, visit and like our Facebook page if you have not done so as yet. Invite others to do the same. And we have a great rest of the week. We'll see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m. sharp. Eastern Standard Time right here at Renew and Transform Ministry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye now. We love you in the love of Jesus.